Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome to the Salty Science Podcast. So in the past few episodes, we've discussed three key topics in marine science, salinity, temperature, and density, which in my personal opinion, form the foundation or building blocks of marine science, and is the common denominator across every discipline involving the ocean, from physics to chemistry to biology to microbial processes, and even applies to all the different locations a marine scientist could study, from tropical to polar regions, to the open ocean, to coastal and estuarine regions, and yes, even the deep sea. And every marine scientist needs to know about these three components, salinity, temperature, and density. And so before we move on to a new topic, there is one more foundational piece I want to cover. And I've already made some mention of it in previous episodes, but I want to get into a little more detail before we move on because we'll be drawing on this information in future episodes. Okay, so with that said, I'd like to introduce you to the Kleins. And no, I'm not talking about Calvin, but the halocline, the thermocline, and the pycnocline. And these three clines are important in our understanding of the ocean because they do everything from impacting ocean circulation to impacting where marine organisms can live and even create vertical barriers that some organisms and vital nutrients can't even cross. And finally, these clines have even appeared on the big screen. And one great example of this is in the 2018 movie The Meg, starring Jason Statham them, in which they highlighted that it was a super deep thermocline that acted as a barrier, keeping the once thought to be extinct megalodon in the deep ocean. Until, of course, something goes wrong and we accidentally break open the barrier, thus releasing all mayhem on fun-loving, happy-go-lucky tourists spending their vacation at the beach. And no, the Meg is not sponsoring this episode, I just really enjoyed the movie, and my favorite shark just happens to be the megalodon. But anyway, so getting back to the clines, my first question is, what is a cline? Well, the word klein, and that's C-L-I-N-E, comes from a Greek word and means a continuum with an infinite number of gradations from one extreme to the other. Or in other words, instead of having a dichotomy such as black or white, a klein is a spectrum or a gradient between the two extremes or end members. So if you did have the two extremes or the two end members of black and white, the klein would be all the different shades of gray between black and white. Ha ha ha, I just thought of it. Fifty Shades of Grey. No, they're not a sponsor and I haven't read the book, but anyway. The key point is this. When you hear or see a word that ends with klein, think of a gradient of whatever the first part of the word is. For example, let's just jump right into our first klein, the halo klein. When you hear the word halo klein, you hear the word klein, so you should automatically start thinking gradient or spectrum, even if you don't know what halo means. But it just so happens that the word halo also comes from a Greek word, meaning salt. So now when you hear the word halocline, you can start thinking salt gradient. And so when it comes to the ocean and different coastal regions, when we talk about halocline's, we're talking about a region within the water or water column where there is a gradient of salinity. So generally, if we were to look at the ocean, there is a lot of mixing at the surface due to things like the wind and waves. So you have a layer of water where the salinity or concentration of salt is just about the same. And then as you go deep enough so that there's no more mixing, you tend to have a gradient or spectrum of increasing salinity until you reach a depth where the salinity is about the same, no matter how much deeper you go. And so the halocline is just that region where the salinity value is changing with depth. And marine scientists will sometimes, for the sake of simplicity, will describe the ocean in three layers with respect to these clines, such as the halocline. So you have the surface layer, the halocline layer, and the deep layer. And of course, the depth at which this gradient occurs changes over time with different seasons as well as with the tides or different storm events. For instance, if you had a really windy day, there will be more wind energy to mix the water deeper down. So the halocline might be deeper within the water column or the range of the gradient can change depending on if you have a lot of rain or evaporation going on in a particular area. And going back to our color example, if white represents the surface layer and black represents the deep 
shape layer. Instead of 50 shades, you could have 10 or 20 or even 100 depending on the different conditions. Okay, so now let's move on to our next Klein, and that is the thermocline. So again, we're talking about a Klein here, so start automatically thinking gradient. And the meaning of thermocline might come a little easier because thermo, thermometer, so we're thinking temperature here. And the word thermo actually comes from a Greek word meaning heat. So now when we say the word thermocline, you can think of a heat or temperature gradient. And this one you might be a little bit more familiar with if you've ever gone swimming in the ocean or even a lake. For example, when you get in the water and you go out a little ways, you'll notice that all of a sudden the water near your feet is way colder than the water near, say, near your head or shoulders or even the rest of your body. And I've even felt this change in temperature when I've gone scuba diving. But me personally, I've never quite been able to feel the gradient, but I can always detect the feeling of an extreme temperature difference. However, even though I can't feel it, there is a gradient. And so if I was to take a YSI or another form of a thermistor or a thermometer in the water with me, I would be able to see that somewhere between the warmer water near my shoulders and the colder water near my feet, there is a thermocline or temperature gradient. And in this example, I'm talking about a rather shallow system. So the thermocline may only span the depth of maybe a quarter of a meter or even a couple of feet deep. But in the ocean, the thermocline can span several meters deep. And again, the specific depth at which the thermocline starts varies with season and weather conditions as well as location. And as you'll remember from episodes three and four, the sun produces solar radiation energy. And the portion of the radiation energy that reaches the surface of the ocean we call solar insulation. And it's this solar insulation that is primarily responsible for heating up the surface layer of the ocean. And so more solar insulation means more heat energy, which means warmer water. And if you have strong winds, you have even more energy to mix that heated or warmer water deeper into the water column, thus changing the depth at which the thermocline starts. And fun side fact, in the open ocean, we have what's called the permanent thermocline, which is between 200 to 300 meters and 1,000 meters deep, which is where the temperature starts to drop. And then from about 1,000 meters to the ocean floor, the temperature remains pretty much the same all year long and only changes very little between zero and three degrees Celsius. And this is due to really cold, dense waters from the pole sinking and moving towards the equator. And the permanent thermocline is not to be confused with seasonal thermoclines, which can set up above the permanent thermocline. For instance, in the spring and summer when the ocean receives more solar insulation, a thermocline can form above even the permanent thermocline, and in some places, instead of having a three-layer, you can have like a five-layer system. All right, so now let's talk about our third cline, the pycnocline. So again, it's another cline, so automatically start thinking gradient. But what the heck's a pycno? P-Y-C-N-O. And the word pycno also comes from a Greek word meaning thick or dense and relates to density. So putting it together, pycnocline is referencing a density gradient. And we know that density is a function of salinity and temperature as well as pressure. And so the pycnocline can be thought of as kind of combining our thermocline and halocline. But to be honest, when studying the ocean or a body of water, I personally find it more useful to look directly at or for the pycnocline because it will tell me more about what's happening in the water than just the halocline or thermocline alone. And when it comes to the pycnocline, this is where the big barriers start coming into play. And there's a great YouTube video by Drs. Peter and Sharon Franks from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography that I'll post the link on the Salty Science Weebly page that demonstrates how the ocean can almost physically be divided into three layers or really almost like three distinct boxes based on density. And I also have a few videos of my own that I'll also post on our Salty Science Weebly page. And in these videos, you can see that the less dense water sits on top of the denser water, almost like one box sitting on top of another. And then you can have this middle layer that can even be a gradient or a cline, as long as it's denser than the surface layer and less dense than the bottom layer, and it too acts like its own box. And as you'll see in these videos, which represent the ocean, the boxes won't mix with each other, unless of course there's a strong mixing energy, say like from the wind. But often what the case is, the wind isn't strong enough to mix these layers. So you have these three distinct boxes or layers. And a final note or comment that I'd like to make on this is, when 
you see a climb happening in the ocean or in a coastal area or estuary or even in lakes, marine scientists will say or describe the water as being stratified, which basically means that we're saying that there's layers within the water column and that because of these layers, there are differences between surface water and bottom water. And if you hear someone say that the water is stratified, it also tells us that the water is not homogenous or well mixed. And so be on the lookout for gradients and differences between surface and bottom water, regardless of how deep the water is at that location. Okay, so here's a quick summary of everything we covered in this episode. In this episode, we talked about the three major clines in marine science, the halocline, thermocline, and pycnocline. And a cline just references a gradient or spectrum of some sort. Halo means salt, so halocline references a salt or salinity gradient. Thermo means heat, so thermocline references a heat or temperature gradient. And pycno references density, so a pycnocline refers to a density gradient. And when we see a cline in the water, we'll say that the water is stratified because these clines set up boundaries or barriers within the water column, separating the water into almost three distinct layers or boxes, the surface, the cline, and the deep layer, in which it takes a lot of energy for these things to mix between layers or boxes, and... That concludes the end of our summary. Okay, so now let's end this episode with asking the question, why do we care? So besides being featured in modern day films, such as The Meg, like I've mentioned it throughout this episode, as well as in previous episodes, the Klein set up internal boundaries or barriers and can actually prevent vital nutrients and key elements and even some organisms from crossing between these layers. And this can be good or bad depending on how you look at it. And of course, we'll get into this in more detail in future episodes, but as a a quick example. If we look at phytoplankton and nutrients, and phytoplankton are of course the single-celled plants that are at the bottom of many marine food webs and also provide us the service of producing about 50% of the oxygen we breathe. Thank you phytoplankton. And phytoplankton need really two main things, sunlight and nutrients. And so when the water is stratified, the phytoplankton are light enough that they stay suspended in the surface layer where there is plenty of sunlight. And so that's good. But over time, they use up all of the nutrients in the surface layer, and so it becomes depleted. But there is this bounty of nutrients in the bottom layer. But of course, those nutrients are trapped in this bottom layer, which if you're a phytoplankton and want to keep growing, this is bad. And like I said, we'll be getting into this in more detail later on. And then of course, when you have gradients or clines in the water, think movement. And in this case, think vertical movement. And when we start talking about the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, you'll be ready to go because clines impact the big global ocean circulation. And then on a personal note, Right now, my own research is focusing on estuarine systems. And so when I see a cline or don't see a cline, it tells me a lot about what's going on in the water and what type of energies or forces are happening within the system, as well as what type of circulation is going on as well. And when I study open ocean systems, like when I went out to sea in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean, the clines also tell me about open ocean circulation and what different chemical and biological processes might be happening or could be happening within the water column. And so now I invite you to share your thoughts with me. Why else should we care about the clines in the ocean? And if you'd like to share your thoughts with me, I'd love to hear them. You can email me at saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com. And if you email me before Saturday, October 26th, you might hear your answers read aloud in our first listeners episode, which will air Friday, November 1st. Okay, so until next time, don't forget to help protect our oceans with the four R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse, especially plastic stuff. And to always stay salty. Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to www.saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com where I've posted some cool videos, my study notes, and some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram, user handle Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube, plus a number of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener supported, so if you would like to show your support, visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash 
Salty Science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount or join the Salty Science crew for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon and sign up today.